been a long journey, but we finally got here where the Sahara meets the sea. Mauritania in West Africa is one of the poorest countries on Earth. But it has one thing the world wants, fish. They're going to hit the water and apparently the fish are going to jump in the net. But this is the national park, not the real Mauritania. Over the horizon is the European Union's fishing fleet. It's headed south to trawl Mauritania's waters. We get Mauritania's fish, they get desperately needed cash. The politicians say it's good for everyone. We were beginning a journey to see if they're right. In Mauritania, almost everyone lives by the sea. The desert has driven them there. Okay, look at that, it's just flat Sahara, from as far as you can see, and it's so hot. Our destination was Mauritania's main fishing port, Nouadhibou. <laughs> Down at the waterfront, there was a group of angry fishermen. They were angry with Europe, angry with the Mauritanian government. It's a very strange atmosphere. Something seems to have happened. We're going to try and find out what it is. The fishermen here go out in motorised canoes. They call them pirogues. OK. Uh, a, there was an accident last night with a pirogue and it hasn't come back and they're going to go and look for it. Three of them were saved and brought in by another pirogue, but one is still missing. They blamed Europe. In exchange for £54 million a year, around 250 EU boats can fish these waters. They now had to go out further and longer to get a decent catch, and that costs lives. Normally the pirogue has many fewer people on it than that, but they're all desperate to get out there and look for their uh, colleague. But they didn't expect to find 17-year-old Mohamed Val. 290 local fishermen have lost their lives in the last year. We searched for the owner of the missing boat. Half a million people, a fifth of the population, rely on fishing. It's not just the Europeans who are exploiting Mauritania's waters. On a much smaller scale, the Russians, Chinese, Koreans and Japanese have all made deals. Bonjour. 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 Ça va? Ça va? Ça va bien? Enchanté. Bai Gay was just back from the waterfront. It turned out he owned eight boats. His teenage sons were at sea that very moment. He says before the big boats arrived, there were plenty of fish, but now it's all changed. My catches are a tenth of what they were, he complained. He said he'd given his sons mobile phones because pirogues were being sunk by trawlers sneaking into the waters close to shore, waters reserved for local fishermen. Accidents. Accidents. He, he, he says this happens every night. So there are incursions. There are incursions in the dans la zone interdite chaque nuit. The grand battle. The battle of Europe or the battle Chinois or all the battles. All the battles. He says all the boats are doing this. European, Chinese, Korean. They're all coming into the zone at night, uh, which is completely forbidden in the agreement. A few days before, a neighbour had been killed in this kind of accident. Bai Gay took me to see the dead man's brothers. They said it had happened at night. It seemed a trawler had cut his boat in two. 
There were five people on this pirogue, and four of them knew how to swim, but his brother didn't know how to swim and went down with the boat. It was, it was a European boat that hit the pirogue. I arranged to return later. I wanted to meet the survivors to corroborate the accusation, but it didn't happen. After we were here talking to the dead man's brother, uh, he was apparently visited by a couple of heavies from the government or the secret police, we don't know what. And uh, he's now disappeared out of town, and nobody else seems willing to speak to us about it. We drove a few miles outside the port. Mauritania used to have its own fleet of trawlers. Not anymore. For five years, Europe has kept a heavily subsidized fleet at work in these waters. Mauritanian trawlermen can't compete. It was time to travel out to the European boats. I had arranged a rendezvous. A hospital ship looking after European fishermen was going to dock and give me a ride out to the fleet. Hello? Esperanza del Mar, Esperanza del Mar. But an emergency had kept them at sea. I needed to find another way to visit the trawlers. Bonjour, bonjour, salam alaikum. Vous savez où je peux louer un bateau pour faire un voyage? Oh, I'd spotted some dilapidated fishing boats operated by foreign fishermen who'd settled in Nouadhibou. I tried to find one that would take me out to sea. It was difficult. Helping journalists, I was told, could mean trouble with the authorities. Oh. <laughs> But eventually, I persuaded a crew to help. Their boat was called the Al Torfik. At dawn the next morning, we prepared to leave the port in search of the European fleet. We were told they were at least five hours out to sea. Our Spanish captain, Bravlio Garcia, was sure he could persuade one of the Spanish trawlers who make up three quarters of the fleet to let me on board. As well as the Spanish boats, there are also Dutch, Italian, Portuguese, and even an Irish super trawler. Twenty-five miles out, we finally spotted them. Each can catch in a day what a local fisherman takes in a year. Captain Garcia asked the first group of trawlers we'd seen if they would let us on board. They said they were flattered, but preferred not to be on television. <laughs> We were still optimistic. All around us, we could see European trawlers. Captain Garcia tracked down a Spanish trawler he was sure would take us. He started his sales pitch on our behalf. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Within minutes, it was clear the word reporter was complicating matters badly. We've just managed to literally flag this one down, um, but we've contacted the captain. It's a Spanish boat, and he won't give us permission to board. That's a huge net. These boats have high-tech equipment to hunt down shoals of fish, but even their average catch has dropped by two-thirds in recent years. The number of fish in these waters seems to be plummeting. Mm. 
And one of the Al Tawfiq's crew told me that he feared the EU boats were doing permanent damage. The problem, he said, lay in the heavy nets they dragged along the seabed. Uh, so he's explaining that the problem with boats like this that fish the seabed is that they, they, they smash all the rocks and the hiding places for the octopus and the deep water fish. When that happens, the, 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 um, the whole chain is, is broken. We tried for hours to get on board a trawler, but with no success. A storm was closing in, so we headed back. On the way, they picked up their fish traps. Like the pirogue fishermen, they say they're only catching a tenth of what they used to. The World Wide Fund for Nature says the current level of fishing off Mauritania is unsustainable. Seven hours, and um, it was stomach churning, to be quite honest. Every fisherman I spoke to said these waters were being overfished, but in this authoritarian country, few would say so on camera. However, Manuel Prieto, a Spanish captain living here, did speak out. He told me that a scientific study had recommended a 25% cut in the octopus and squid caught from the seabed. Some hope. The EU has just negotiated an increase. He says basically the industrial fishing boats are just destroying these waters. They're ruining the seabed, and he's got to go much further out to get his catch. Si ça continue, vous pensez que les poissons sont menacés? Terminé. I think that's. Se termina. Así de claro. Así de claro se termina. Como siga con esto. I think that's quite clear. He says if it continues as it is at the moment, it's finished for everybody, including the fish. The military unit which polices the agreement had agreed to take us on patrol. We jumped at the chance. In two weeks, we'd seen them leave port on only one other occasion. They told us they'd be inspecting European trawlers. The rules are strict about what and where these boats can fish. At first, the trawler ignored the frantic signals. Finally, her crew did cut the engines. They were astonished at being stopped. When I boarded, I discovered this wasn't a European boat, but politically a far safer target, a trawler owned by Mauritanians in partnership with the Chinese. The patrol glanced at the catch and the size of the nets. Then the commander quickly checked the paperwork. To me, it seemed he was going through the motions for my benefit. Within five minutes, we were leaving, with the commander giving a slightly awkward lecture about the need to stop for his patrol boat. I assumed we'd be off in search of EU trawlers, but now they told me their boat wasn't designed to go out that far, and the two patrol boats that could were both out of action. Instead, we chased a local boat, suspected of fishing where it shouldn't. It seemed perverse that they were targeting the small fry instead of the EU trawlers. After all, we'd heard repeated allegations that the trawlers fish where they shouldn't, use illegally sized nets, and catch fish they're not licensed to. The crew were told to report to the police back in port. A 13-year-old boy was taken to security. We headed back towards Nwadibu. Another storm was brewing. Suddenly, the patrol flagged down a second pirogue they said was fishing in a conservation area. The crew faced a hefty fine. The storm was getting worse. Most fishermen had already returned to port.
I wondered what would happen to those caught far out to sea. On the quayside, a row erupted. While the pirog owners argued with the commander, I spoke to one of the arrested fishermen. He described the daily battle for Mauritania's fish. He says they absolutely have to go into that zone to find the fish that they want. And they'll probably get fined, but that's the way it is. One of the leaders of Mauritania's local fishermen had arrived back in town. He'd been in Brussels while the latest version of the EU agreement was negotiated. I was told I'd find him inspecting a pirogue which had limped back to port after colliding with a trawler. Ah, c'est là. Sid Ahmed told me the crew were lucky to be alive. C'est le bateau. He believes the whole EU deal is a catastrophe. Uh -huh. What makes matters worse, he said, is that local fishermen don't see any of the money Europe's paying the Mauritanian government. And it's not just the fishermen. He took me to a processing plant. They just unloaded that day's fish from the pirogues. <laughs> The catch wasn't enough to keep the factory busy. Sid Ahmed wants EU boats to start landing their catches here instead of taking them to Europe. But under the new agreement, except for a few token visits, he told me it wasn't going to happen. He says that it doesn't make sense for, for the people here. If the fish aren't unloaded here, then they don't gain anything, any extra value, and that's the fault of the accord. There's a further twist. Many of the fish taken from these waters by the EU will be processed in Spain and sent back in tins. In his office were pictures of all the local fishermen. Blank spaces marked the dead. These ones here, photos have been taken off. died. I left Sid Ahmed in despair over the deaths, the declining catches, the grinding poverty. We'd been with the Mauritanian military out at sea. Now I was given a chance to fly in their surveillance plane. This aircraft is supposed to check that EU trawlers don't stray into vital spawning grounds or the areas reserved for local fishermen. We climbed over Nwadibu. We passed over one of three radar stations which helped the planes spot offenders. A few days before, it had been out of action. Under Mauritanian law, EU trawlers can be fined and have their catch confiscated if they break the rules. But the courts require hard evidence. That means using a special camera which photographs the boat and automatically records its position. I asked where it was. Hey, normally they have a camera, but it's broken. I'd been told that if EU boats broke the rules, it was at night. The crew told me the plane doesn't fly at night. The time had come to go to the country's capital to ask the Mauritanian government why it thinks the fishing agreement is such a good deal. Nouakchott is home to the ruling elite. They're Arab Moors who have little in common with the fishermen. This country is deeply divided on racial lines. Well, we've spent weeks trying to get to see someone from the government. And today, it looks like we're going to get an interview with the Minister of Fisheries. Mohammed El Mokhtar Ulzamel was irritated when I asked him whether he'd just sold the country's birthright. Mauritania needs cash, he said. Why shouldn't we sell our fish? It's a simple equation. 
marché des ressources par rapport à ces possibilités de, de, de pêche. Europe has more boats than fish to catch. Mauritania has more fish than boats to catch it. Mais je vous signale que... He denied that fish stocks were threatened, and he said he hoped that in future more European trawlers would pay to fish his waters. He says what the European boats pay for fishing here is much more significant than what the Mauritanian boats can put into the economy. He's right. The EU deal brings in 50% of this country's hard currency. For the government, a guaranteed paycheck, as long as the fish last. Since we got here, the local fishermen have been telling us that the trawlers, including EU boats, fish illegally. We knew the authorities must have the statistics, but they just wouldn't give them to us. Today, we're really pleased because we finally got them. Okay, so far this year, there have been 222 violations. Spain, 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 Greece, Portugal, Portugal. We'd seen for ourselves that the agreement was policed with a light touch. But even so, in the previous eight months, 60 EU trawlers had been caught fishing illegally. One, two, three, four, five, six times. I went to the offices of the European Union. I hoped to speak to someone about illegal fishing and the new deal with Mauritania that had been signed three weeks before. Not a chance. Apparently, uh, no one from the uh, European Union office here is authorised to speak to us. Everything has to come from Brussels. Uh, but they've given us a uh, three-page press release, which uh, we got off the internet three weeks ago after the accord was signed. I returned to the port of Nwadibu. The weather had settled, and I joined pirogue captain Baisen on a fishing trip. It seemed to me that in order to keep part of Europe's vast subsidised fishing fleet in business, we had persuaded Mauritania to sell its future. Certainly, the fishermen here feel the one thing they have to offer the global economy has been stolen from them, condemning them to a life of poverty and perpetual danger. Everyone has a story to tell. Uh -huh. Apparently, they were sleeping, they were anchored, and they were sleeping in the pirogue, and a large boat came along and cut the anchor chain. It's a, ah. he, he says after cutting the anchor chain, the, uh, the boat then hit the pirogue, and as soon as it realised it hit the pirogue, he says it cut out its lights and disappeared. Vous êtes dans l'eau? Yeah, it's on the Sunday. He was in the water for 11 hours before he was rescued by another pirogue. Soon, on the horizon, we could see the trawlers hard at work. In Europe, we eat a third of all the fish caught in the world. Only a tiny fraction comes from our own exhausted waters. fishing trip wasn't a success. We sat for hours but caught nothing. They say it's been like this since the big boats arrived. What's happening to Mauritania's fishermen is part of the hidden cost of how we lead our lives. I'm just trying to swing as the water. Look at the listening way.